and have power over the universe. To the crowd pressing upon you, you said, power has gone out from me. Then to the hemorrhaging woman who was healed by touching the fringe of your clothing, you said, O daughter, your faith has made you well. Go now in peace. Now we ask you to heal us from every sin that we may stand with purity before you all the days of our lives. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father who had compassion on all people and sent his only begotten Son to save them, and to the only begotten Son who bandaged their wounds and who poured healing ointment on them, and to the life-giving Holy Spirit who sanctifies those who take refuge in him. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. All-powerful and almighty Father, long ago you spoke to our ancestors in various ways. But at the appointed time, you sent your beloved Son to us. Through his words and miracles, he taught us about you and commanded us to love one another. We thank you for all that you have given us through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We glorify you, O Father, the Lord of life and salvation. You are the Holy One who knows what lies in the hearts of those who love you. And you heal all the pains of those who take refuge in you. As your only begotten Son healed the paralytic and the blind man, the hemorrhaging woman and the lame man, Heal us and fill our souls with calm and peace as your Son calmed the surging waves. 
Now, O Lord, we implore you with the fragrance of this incense for all those who are suffering. Pour the balm of your consolation upon their wounded hearts. Watch over them with your fatherly eye, lest in trials and sufferings they stray from your love. Raise your right hand and bless also those who are healthy, so that joy may dwell within the hearts of all. We raise glory and praise to you, to your Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Physician, lover of all people, we thank you for your compassion, for you have bandaged the wounds of our suffering humanity. Heal the sick and comfort the sorrowful. Accept our prayers as you accepted the plea of the hemorrhaging woman. Bless our community that prays to you. We believe that you are our Savior and our Redeemer, and we await the day of your glorious resurrection. To you be glory and thanks now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Touched his cloak, 
all on earth be attentive, she was cured and made it known. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. I have great confidence in you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with encouragement I am overflowing with joy, all the more because of all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted in every manner, external conflicts and internal fears. But God, who encourages the downcast, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his arrival, but also by the encouragement with which he was encouraged in regard to you, as he told us of your yearning, your lament, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I saddened you by my letter, I do not regret it. If I did regret it, for I see that the latter did sadden you, if only for a while, I now rejoice because you were saddened, not because you were saddened, but because you were saddened unto repentance. For you were saddened in a godly manner, so that you did not suffer loss in anything because of us. For godly sorrow produces a salutary, a salutary repentance without regret, but worldly sorrow produces death. For behold what earnestness this gladly sorrow has produced for you as well as readiness for a defense and indignation and fear and yearning and zeal and punishment. In every manner, you have shown yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world. 
Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, When Jesus returned, the crowds welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And a man named Jairus, an official of the synagogue, came forward. And he fell at the feet of Jesus, and he begged him to come to his house, because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. And as he went, the crowds almost crushed him. But a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years, who had spent her entire livelihood on doctors, and was unable to be cured by anyone, came up behind him and touched the tassel on his cloak. Immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus then said, Who has touched me? And while all were denying it, Peter said to him, Rabbi, the crowds are pushing and pressing in upon you. But Jesus said, Someone has touched me, for I know that power has gone out from me. And when the woman realized that she had not escaped notice, she came forward, trembling, and falling down before him, she explained in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And while he was yet speaking, someone from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the rabbi any longer. And on hearing this, Jesus answered him, Do not be afraid. Only have faith, and she shall be saved. And when he arrived at the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the child's father and mother. All were weeping and mourning for her when he said to them, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but only sleeping. And they ridiculed him, mocking him because they knew that she had died. But he took her by the hand, and he called to her, Child, arise. And her breath returned, and she immediately arose. He then directed that she should be given something to eat, and her parents were astounded. And he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. This is the truth, peace be with you. For the sorrow that is according to God works penance, steadfast unto salvation. But the sorrow of this world works death. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So in the gospel, of course, there are a number of things that are taking place here. What the church is focusing on is the woman in the middle. And it's important in understanding the old law what is actually really happening here? This is more than just the healing of a woman who is sick. In the old law, 
The woman's period, the menstrual flow, was considered unclean. So this woman, having this di medical difficulty for 12 years, has been considered liturgically, religiously, impure. And because of that, she's not supposed to actually be in public either. So there's a number of things. This is why she's hiding. This is why she cowers. And why St. Luke wants us to understand, because he puts in very clearly, when she realized she has not escaped notice. Her only intention is to come here, hopefully not be seen, not be noticed in the crowd. And all she wants to do is get down on the ground, not approach him, not talk to him. It's very human. So in one way, she's doing a human thing of rationalizing. Well, yes, I'm unclean, but if no one knows, and if no one sees me, and if I don't actually talk to the rabbi, and so I won't even actually touch him, and touch the fringe. So in the old law, the men to show their fidelity would put tassels, fringe on the bottom, on the very bottom of their clothing, so normally on the bottom of their cloak. You see it, if you've ever seen Hasidic Jews around, you see them, they have the strings that hang off because they're tying them on the bottom of their shirts. But they have them hanging outside of their trousers, so you see them still. But of course, our Lord and everybody in the age, everyone's wearing these long garments that go down to their ankles. So the fringe is on the very bottom, which for her is excellent because I'm even closer and out of the way. And if everyone's pushing and jostling in this crowd, all I want to do is get down on the ground and just be able to just touch the very edge, not even his cloak, but the fringe hanging off of the cloak. That's all she's looking for. With this hope that after 12 years, and you notice that St. Luke, who is a physician, when he recounts the story, because it's recounted in other gospels, when he recounts the story, he wants us to make sure and understand that for 12 years, she's been going to physicians and she spent all of her money and nothing has been improved. So St. Luke, who is by profession a physician, wants us also to know that detail. She has exhausted every means possible to be relieved of this burden. So she's unclean and to touch the rabbi is even worse. You notice it in the story that's told by St. John with the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman says to our Lord, she's shocked because not only is he talking to her as a man of Israel to a Samaritan woman, which is like completely unheard of, he's also a rabbi speaking to a woman in public. And so this was something that what this woman does is shocking to everyone. And that's why when she comes up, she's basically groveling on the ground because she is terrified. She has violated the law. And because she has touched the rabbi, she has made him unclean, ritually, by the law of Moses. Anything that someone who is unclean, anything they touch, any vessels, whatever, are also considered unclean. And again, unclean doesn't mean demonic or evil. It means inept, unable to be used for any of God's service. You make it incapacitated, so to speak. And so that's really to understand that cultural and religious background of what's taking place with this woman. But of course, for us, as we've been considering last week, we consider the incense and the aspect that behind the actions that we do or don't do and supposed to do, that behind these actions, there are further causes and reasons, and really in the whole process of the spiritual life, it's to understand that salvation is a process. Salvation is not a magical formula. Salvation is a process of healing of the individual. As I've mentioned to you, in the Syriac tradition, we speak of it as returning to Eden, the return to paradise, to find the integrity and the health of grace that was given to Adam in the garden. And so <clears throat> when we look at this, the reason why this text is chosen is not just to give us a strong story, but it's also for us to understand that our sins, the actions that we do, the words that we speak, the thoughts that we have, the actions that we should be doing that we don't do, they are in a very real sense our hemorrhaging. These things are always coming from us constantly, a flow 
of actions and words and deeds and all the things that we shouldn't be doing that really ultimately make us unclean. But it's not really those actions making us unclean that are the problem any more than blood coming from this woman in any real way. There's a deeper problem, obviously, medically happening with this woman that brings about this hemorrhaging. And so <clears throat> we're told that when we work in this world, of course, we deplete ourselves in a sense in this hemorrhaging of sin, depleting ourselves with only the remedies of this world. Well, I'll just try not to say naughty words. Well, that, that's nothing. That's purely negative. I mean, it's a nice thing to say, yes, and we all say those kinds of things. But it doesn't mean anything. It's like saying I will not try to have terminal cancer. I mean, doing nothing about it doesn't make the tumor go away. Any, so a resolution of I will no longer cuss and swear doesn't do anything. And of course, anyone who's tried that longer than three days knows it doesn't do anything. I have to do something positive that resolves that. And that's why St. Paul, when he's writing the letter to the Corinthians, what he's writing about this pain of God, godly pain and worldly pain, what he's writing about is he's making reference to the letter that he has written to that parish. Because in that parish, they have a man who married his stepmother. Now, Commentators usually think, well, maybe this guy was wealthy. You know, wealthy people get away with stuff like this. Now, nobody else in the parish should say, well, looking at this, you're marrying your father's wife. Now, for us, that sounds bizarre, but it's more understandable in a classical world when you have a lot of 50-year-old men marrying 18-year-old girls and your son is 16. And your father passes away and you kind of like your stepmother and really you're the same age and so you marry her. It was not unheard of, but it is incestuous, and it is something which is, for Christian Catholic morals, completely unacceptable. But you have this marriage in that parish, and that is what St. Paul is writing to them about. He says, even among the pagans, this is unheard of. How are you tolerating this in your parish? And so he writes a letter to him saying, you must expel this man from the parish. Oh, well, he's a good donor. His envelope is always stuffed, every collection. And so you get this squirming, and he writes them and telling them, this does not matter. And that's what he's referring to as the pain. I know that my letter caused you pain. And it bothered me that it caused pain, but not in the long run. Because it is a godly pain, which brought about repentance, a change. Whereas worldly pain, the pain of this world, brings death. If you had continued in this way, kind of papering over your sense of Catholic morality, and I had not caused any pain, you'd all be dying. But by writing the letter to make you understand what is the proper order of moral Catholicism, Yes, it was painful, but because it was godly, you were brought to repentance. That's why it's also important to understand is that pain is not a problem. It just depends on what kind of pain and why. Pain we can't escape from. Again, it's one of those images of modern Christianity where everything is supposed to be sugar, or in the days, as they talk about now, rainbows and unicorns. That's what Christianity has become nowadays, and the idea is that Jesus came to make sure you don't feel any pain whatsoever and you always have brownies. So when it comes time for Lent, it's that like that modern vision of Catholicism, you don't know what to do. I mean, for heaven's sakes, if I give up a chocolate bar sometime during the week, it's like, Murdom! I'm heroic! Because we've been so eviscerated in the rest of our presentation and our practice of our faith. And this is sad. And that's why this reading actually is very good. It's confusing at first just to hear it in itself. But St. Paul is saying is, I am now very happy that you were so miserable after that letter because you're doing so much better now. But he begins the whole section by saying, I have such confidence in you now. I have such confidence and I glory in what, what you're doing. You're moving forward so nicely. 
It's not the hellfire and damnation brimstone sermon. You don't really need those, but you need to say, this is wrong. And yes, I know there's an ouch factor, but look towards the good of where we're going. And that ouch factor will actually become very redemptive, very salvific. God himself knew that this woman who was hemorrhaging, the embarrassment that this was causing her, and the pain. And yet, 2,000 years later, she is still something that we can look at and admire what goes on in this exchange. And notice that our Lord says that it's your faith, it's just this confidence in you to find this healing rabbi that has made you whole. And that's what's very important. So as we're looking over these weeks, and next week we'll talk about the actual liturgical ceremony of the incense, but we talked about that aspect of the atonement of sin, that aspect of making reparation of what brings together as one, which is what atonement means, of this notion of, so it's not just God invites us to be healed. He also requires things of us, and sometimes he requires things that are quite heavy, like 12 years of this poor woman. But in the end, his desire is to heal. And everyone individually has their own path they have to walk. And no one, not my spouse, not my children, not my parents, can walk it for me or even directly aid me on that path. Indirectly, yes, they can be supportive, they can pray for me, they can support me morally. But in the end, the path has to be walked by me and me alone. And that is pretty horrifying, which is why at the moment of judgment, we stand stripped and naked before the divine light. No one can answer for us except us. So that in this aspect of sin, as we talked about last week, sin is not the direct problem, the action or the lack of action. It is in the sense of the gospel today, that sin is the eruption, like a hemorrhaging of deeper wounds that take place. So conversion is to come behind and to understand better. So that there are basically three stages in our conversion. The first is the recognition. Who am I truly? So we spoke about that a bit last week. But that's the, the ouch part, the pain. Nobody, nobody wants to look at and confront. But at some point, minimally, doesn't mean we run down the street screaming, you know, I'm a liar. But it means that, I, that it means that personally, I have to be able to look in the mirror and say, you are a liar, and you have been a liar for most of your adult life. Just me and my mirror, but I have to be able to say that within me. That's the recognition. That's what we call contrition. Contrition in, La in Latin literally means to be shattered. Cum tritere, literally to break all apart. It's a very strong word, but it's because of that recognition, because no one, no one, no one on the face of the earth wants to be or to be known as a liar. And so the first is the prognostication, if you like. What is actually going on here? And that is the pain that St. Paul talks about. If it's a pain of God, godly, it works us to actually towards betterment and repentance. But the pain of the world, that's also your witnessing. The worldly pain, it's my addiction, my depression, my suicide. That's what the world's pain does because everyone inevitably has to be confronted with the reality of their lives. And we either are, we confront that prognostication with a vision of knowing that it is a progress towards being healing, healed, or we just plunge into this dark pit because the world doesn't have anything to offer us to be healed. And that's why we live in a culture which is being consumed by people who are strung out on drugs and alcohol and ultimately dead on their opioids. It's not to say that they're demonic. It's not to say they're even bad. It's to say that they're looking for something in a place that cannot resolve it, cannot give it. That is the distinction St. Paul then is giving in the epistle between a godly sorrow and the worldly sorrow. 
But having that prognostication, then we have to have the diagnosis as to what the prescription of the remedy is. So what do I do then? If I make a resolution that I'm not going to lie anymore, nothing happens because it's purely a negative thing. It doesn't change anything. But if I make a resolution that in my examination of conscience, I'll say a Hail Mary for each of those little, so-called little white lies, well, you know, those first days and first weeks may be a lot of Hail Marys at the end of my day. But it begins to make me mindful of what I do. And then when I make the next step that I will also make up for those lies, I will go and correct them to say to those that I had lied that it was a lie, correct them, make reparation. That diagnosis moves us from recognition to the diagnosis because we have confidence that it is fixable. The pit of depression comes about is because I just see something as being awful. And suicide is the conclusion, I can't fix this, I am miserable, this is horrible, I just want to get out of here. And so we die. That is the death which is accomplished by the world's means. But when we know that salvation is, a, is something of a progress, of a process, then we have confidence. And again, the word confidence just means to be thoroughly loyal, thoroughly faithful. We know that this is possible to fix. I know that in looking in the mirror saying, I am a liar, I know that I can fix this. I don't have to always be a liar. What does the world say? Well, you know, my grandmother used to tell stories, and my mom, she does that too. In other words, this is a family trait. So now it's going to be an excuse for my third generation of being a liar. We do that also. That's the world's way of talking about these things. But as Christians, we know that these things are healable. They can be fixed, which is why that final aspect is the actual remedy that conversion, that salvation. And again, always remembering that the word salvation, salus in Latin, shalom, shlomo, it always has the aspect of well-being and holiness. And the problem in the modern world is they may make a prognostication. My life is wrong, it has difficulties because of this, this, or this. But the problem in the modern world, the, the very center of it, if you remember in World War II, the 1940s, or the 50s, I can't remember exactly which decade, but it's Pope Pius XII who made the statement at one point of saying that the sin of the modern world is having lost the sense of sin. Now, people in the Middle Ages murdered and committed adultery, but they always knew that it was murder and adultery. We commit adultery and we call it love, re-experiencing my youth. We find something other reason and we redefine these things. So the real problem and the reason why it is such a place of despair is the modern world takes something which even the Christians will recognize as being wrong. They take what is that failing and instead of actually turning and transforming it, they attempt to flee from the pain of recognition. And in fleeing, what they do is they take the recognition and redefine the symptom and the illness as being the norm. That's why you are having this ram down your throats socially. I was talking to a Colby student recently. It was very funny. So I asked him, I said, so what do you do for pronouns at Colby? And so at the beginning of the semester, everyone has to get up and they introduce themselves and they give their names and what their pronouns are. God help us. And so he's a sportive type. He's in the athletics up. He's a mule. And so up there, he just mentioned one guy got up from the Midwest. God bless Midwesterners. Just straightforward, he got up and he says what his name is mentions what his name is, and he says at the end, I'm a dude. And that's it. Well, of course, all of the Northeasterners are like, oh, you can't just simply blaspheme our session like that. 
Now, nobody says that, but that's the reaction emotionally you get from them. And he just thought that was great. You know, and then this kid sat down. The emperor is naked. And you need to say the emperor is naked. You don't need to beat up people or punch them. No, no reason for any kind of, but you need to say, nope, nope, I can see his butt. Nope, he's naked, that's it. You just have to have the honesty because what you're doing is you must uproot, at least contest the modern world's taking of brokenness and sadness and illness and redefining it as being normative. There is no doubt that there are many people who struggle in their lives with a lot of different issues, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, sexually. But you don't take these disorders and define them as being the norm because those people will never have a chance of being healed. And that's the beauty of the story of the hemorrhaging woman. She never turns around and, you know, blasphemes God or anything because of what she's going through. She just knows that she needs to be healed and to be made whole. And that is a very beautiful thing. So the sinful self is not the real self in the sense of what God intends us to be. And it's important that we shake it off and not say, well, my grandmother kind of told stories and my mother told stories, and so I just picked it up. We need to understand that God did not create three generations of women in this family to be liars. That is not the intent of the God of all goodness. And so that the real, the person, the sinful aspect, the sinfulness of our lives is not really what God intends. We don't have a religion that said Jesus loves you just the way you are. That is not Catholicism. It's not even Christianity. It's, it's nothing. It, it is one form of Buddhist sect, but we're not Buddhist. So this idea that somehow you're just good as you are and Jesus loves you just, Jesus wants you to be whole. Jesus wants you to be healthy. Jesus wants you to be transfigured by grace. And so this is the great importance then for us that what we're doing in our conversion is shaking off of what is actually false and injurious within our lives. And that is the paradox of the gospel, is it not? He who seeks his life will lose it. And he who loses his life is kind of jumbled up, confused, brokenness in this valley of tears. He who loses that for my sake will find it. This is a very magnificent Sunday for us. So that sin being the result of a distorted, self-centered, falsified choices, it means that we are distracted. Now everyone knows this word distracted in English, but the word in Latin literally means pulled apart. That's so why you have the word tractor, right? Tractors pull things, right? So distractere is, literally means to pull something apart. Someone who's distracted is being pulled apart. And that is our lives all too often. So we pray for the light to see ourselves, and especially in these days of the great fast, that we can really look in the mirror and say, you, you, you are this, this, and this. And to say it honestly to ourselves in our examination so that we have the ability to go forward, that God bring us back, not of distraction, but to bring us back into the reintegration of our lives, which has his, his desire for us to be healed by grace. And when we do that, that is the path of the return to the garden in the Syriac tradition. And then, then we can hear the echo of the words of St. Paul at the beginning of this reading today. Great is my confidence in you this reestablishment of wholeness. Great is my confidence in you, and great is my glorying about you. God grant us both integrity, light, and a profoundly healthy parish, transformed within the light of the healing God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God and light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, Saint Cora, and Saint Madonna. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
Alleluia. Continue with the Anaphora of St. Peter, Chief of the Apostles, on page 774. 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Father, God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, love and faith that are pleasing to God. For you to receive your blessings and assistance, for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> o Lord, may the light of your face shine upon us. Deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions, that we may raise glory and thanks to you. To your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> the love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly, it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O Maker of all creation. With the angels, we glorify you, and with voices of praise, we cry out and we proclaim.
are holy, O God the Father, and abundant in mercy. Because of your love for us, you sent your Son into the world, and he became flesh of the Virgin Mary for our salvation. He then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. Save us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you. On the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, we, your sinful children, receive your graces. We thank you for them and because of them. May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed, body and soul, from every sin and receive eternal life. O Lord, accept our intercessions and prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, the shout of Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church, 
so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who have desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and a refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country throughout the world, Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Cora, and St. Marama, and all the saints, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Favor, remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers, sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb through your mercy. May our prayer rise like incense which we offer to your Father through you, to you, be glory forever. O God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering, so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into 
O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. O Lord, bless your worshippers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive all their sins. For you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Amen. holy Father, one Amen. holy Son. One Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, for that our bodies may be sanctified by Thy holy blood, and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect, your ho protect them by your holy cross. Be their shelter and refuge and perfect them with your abundant blessings. That we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received. From the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.